Welcome back to the AP Psychology course series. This is lesson number four on descriptive correlational style research. And so this lesson is going to be a direct follow-up to the previous, which focused on the experimental style of research and a more of the uh, causation. This one, on the other hand, is more about correlation. So there's a quick cartoon here about correlational method. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. So the statistics class could have helped this person understand correlation and causation, but it didn't necessarily cause it. That's why it's implying call, uh, correlation as opposed to causation. So what is the descriptive correlational research style? Basically, you're describing a pattern of behavior, and you may have discovered a link or association between variables. So another word for correlation would just be showing an association. Instead of X causing Y, it is now X may be related to Y. There is a lack of control in the descriptive correlational style because you are not talking about a cause and effect relationship, so you are not usually manipulating any variables. So we're going to have three major uh, types of studies involved in this. I'm going to run through those. So you have the naturalistic observation. This is basically when you observe something or someone, some type of organism, it could be an animal or human, and you observe them in their natural environment. You are carefully observing them with the intent of not actually letting them know that you're watching. And so one of the major benefits to this is that it is, if done properly, less artificial than the experiment. Um, you're not really manipulating anything. The only thing you're trying to do is make sure they don't notice that you're actually watching them. This leads to one of the major cons is that there can be the issue of reactivity. So if they happen to notice that you're watching, then it may skew your results. Ultimately, it is a good method if you are able to stay out of sight and um, you know not experience any reactivity. But it is one of the types of methods under the description of correlational style that does not translate well into numerical data specifically for a statistical analysis. So that's something to keep in mind. So the case study is an in-depth investigation into an individual subject. Usually those are going to be used for studying more of the odd or strange weird phenomena. Um, they don't represent the general population well because the majority of the population is not dealing with some weird phenomenon, so the case study would be good for more of the strange or less frequent um, subject matters. It can be highly subjective. There is some criticism of people like Sigmund Freud finding uh, cases of people who would fit some of his ideas before he even conducted experiments, so uh, that's worth noting. So one of the final uh, descriptive correlational methods is the survey or questionnaire. And this is basically when you use interview type questions or an actual questionnaire to gather information on a specific behavior or belief, etc. Uh, surveys are really good because they allow you to get a lot of data at one time. And uh, usually they are pretty easy to collect. So, you know, if you're in a room with 100 people, you dish out a survey, you get it back in a few minutes, bam, and you're done. So the large scale data collection is pretty much the main advantage of the survey. One of the major disadvantages of the survey is that it is pretty much fully dependent on self-reporting data. And so people are going to fall victim to a number of different psychological uh, phenomena as a result of taking surveys, and we're going to look at those in just a second. So overall, evaluating the descriptive correlational style of research, the main advantage is that it does like to study more topics. So overall, you are broadening the scope of things that which you can study. Uh, the major disadvantage is that you cannot demonstrate that two things are linked in a causational manner. So there is no causation. All you can say is that two things may be related. One may be related to the other, but one does not cause the other. Uh, in terms of evaluating the research, so many times if there is a study that you're interested in doing, if it seems like something that might be a popular idea, chances are someone else has studied it. So one of the things that many psychologists will do is use a process called meta-analysis. And what this does is it allows them to combine the results of studies of similar nature or of the same question 
to look at their uh, variable consistency. So if somebody had a, a study where they looked at the effects of smoking on um, lung cancer, and somebody else had a study similar on the effects of smoking on lung cancer, they may be able to apply this idea of meta-analysis, the statistical procedure, and combine the results. This way they can learn about more consistency. Now, when you are doing research, you have really two groups of people. You have a sample and you have a population. And so your sample is really who you are actually uh, evaluating or the people that are involved in your descriptive correlational style. That's the sample. You're going to take the results from your sample and then apply that to the population. So you have to be careful to avoid sampling bias, which is when you have an unrepresentative sample of the population. For example, I could be giving out a survey on you know, what do the students in my class think of the school overall? However, if my class is only full of seniors, I'm only getting a population, uh, I'm only getting a sample of uh, seniors, and I'm ignoring, you know, the other 1,200 students that are in the school who are not in my class or who are not a senior. So if I then say that, hey, everybody thinks the school is great, my sample is just those seniors, but I'm saying that applies to the whole school population when it may in fact not do that. You also have to watch out for the placebo effect, which is that when you have an expectation of a change and it actually leads to your experience of a change. So generally people talk about um, someone going to the doctor and getting a sugar pill and they think that uh, they're getting something that's going to actually help them, but instead you know, they get a sugar pill but they miraculously feel better. So uh, that is documented as a real thing. So uh, the final thing we're going to look at is some of the distortions among self-reporting. So this is uh, some of the few things that people on surveys will uh, possibly fall victim to. So the first is a big one called the social desirability bias. And what this is, is basically on a survey if you just give socially acceptable or favorable answers. And so you're lying and instead of saying how you may really feel, you decide you're just going to put down what you think people would want to hear or what do you think people would be more accepting of or what do you think is the most correct proper way to answer the question. You also have people who fall victim to something known as the response set. In this one they actually answer their surveys or questionnaires in ways that are unrelated to the question. So if there's a general question evaluating what did you think about this class or what did you think about this teacher? Someone who has fallen victim to the response set might go off on a completely different tangent and not evaluate what they're supposed to be doing. And then lastly is the halo effect. So the halo effect occurs when maybe you're in a class that you really, really liked in terms of the subject matter, but you didn't really like the teacher. And so at the end of the year when you do the evaluation for that class and the question says, uh, you know, overall, what did you think of this teacher? And you mark down that you thought they were pretty good, even though it wasn't the teacher, it was the class. So you liked the class so much, you ignored the fact that you didn't like the teacher, and you said the teacher was pretty good. Or another case may be uh, you really don't like a class, but you really enjoy the teacher. At the end of the year, you take the survey, what did you think of the teacher? And you say, well, you know, I didn't really like the teacher very much, even though it was more about the class. So when your overall evaluation spills over into specific ratings, it's letting one evaluation impact the other. And so that is the halo effect. And then to conclude this video, we have the experimenter bias, which if you watched uh, lesson number three, you saw the little cartoon at the end. And so experimenter bias occurs when your expectations of the outcome can influence your obtained results. So one of the ways people combat this is to use the double blind procedure where uh, as a head researcher you don't know who is going to belong to what and neither do the participants. And ultimately this allows you to have an elimination of the experimenter bias. And this concludes lesson number four. Thanks for watching and hope to see you back for lesson number five.